Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Stuart, AP Bio teacher, Mr. Poser. We are starting topic 1.5, structure and function of biological macromolecules in this video today. This is gonna be a long one, so bear with me. I'm gonna try my best not to ramble too much to make this video really long and have you wait through it. So uh, let's get started. Um, this slide you've seen in a previous video, and I'm just outlining here to you today um, that in our last video, 1.4, we really focused on discussing the monomers of these four main biological macromolecules, um, particularly monosaccharides, amino acids, fatty acids, and nucleotides. But today, we are getting into the, well, the really big structures, the macromolecules, or particularly the carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids. Uh, we kind of covered everything we needed to on lipids in our last video, so uh, we're not going to do lipids today, but there's a lot to go over um, in those other three categories, particularly proteins, so let's get to it. Um, you don't have to write that first page down, by the way. I don't know if you figured that out. Uh, but anyway, so let's talk about polysaccharides first. Um, you may know already that many monosaccharides make up what's called a polysaccharide, just like many monomers make up a polymer. It's kind of convenient. Many monosaccharides make up polysaccharides, and polysaccharides can be anywhere from like three uh, links long to hundreds or thousands. And each of those bonds in between um, the monomers, those are called glycosidic linkages. We learned about that in our last video when we were talking about disaccharides. Um, chains of polysaccharides, they can be linear, or they can be in a straight line, or they can be branched out. Um, and it depends on what this, the, the function of the polysaccharide is, uh, depending on, you know, to determine whether or not it's branched or, or, or linear. Uh, for example, a lot of glycogen molecules are branched um, simply because it's an energy storage molecule, but cellulose, uh, which is the carbohydrate that makes, makes up plant cell walls and makes plants rigid, um, that is a linear polysaccharide. Uh, so, wow, that's a typo there. But some polysaccharides, as I just said, are for energy storage, like starch and glycogen. Um, others are for structures. So cellulose is, as I said, made up of plant cell walls. Um, plants store energy in the form of starch, so they make up these long, long energy molecules. Uh, polysaccharides from a bunch of different chains, so they do a bunch of dehydration synthesis, right? Um, glycogen, that's what animals typically have, animals like you and I. Again, if you want a carbo, cro carbo cram, uh, carbo load, you make glycogen and you put store that in your muscles so that you can break off the little monomers later and use them for energy. Um, then finally, chitin, this one over here, it's got some nitrogen in it, so it makes it a little different, but it makes the, up the exoskeleton of insects. Um, so there you go. The, the crunchiness of an insect is you know, thanks to a polysaccharide called chitin. Um, all right, so moving on to proteins. See? We're, um, we're making short work of this. Uh, proteins are made up of many amino acids in a linear chain. Um, so a protein might be one or more of what we call polypeptides, um, as I put here. So um, and we're going to take a look at the different levels of structure of a protein. So a, a protein might be a four or five um, different polypeptides, but a polypeptide is a long folded chain of amino acids, something like you see right here. Um, peptide bonds, these are the bonds that hold the amino acids together, okay, and they're formed at the carboxyl end of each amino acid, so I have this color coded uh, once again. Take a look at this polypeptide up here. Um, if you remember from the last video, every amino acid has what we call an amino end and a carboxyl end. Um, so if we were to go from beginning to end here, take a look, here's the amino end of this glycine, okay, and then the carboxyl end of the glycine is bonded to this... Uh, isoleucine, that's what it is, um, amino acid, so on and so forth. But this carboxyl group and this asparagine over here, I got my amino acids down, um, it's exposed, right? So this is the front of the amino acid, then this is the end of it, it's the carboxyl end. Um, so if we wanted to add more amino acids to this chain through translation, we'd start from this end and not that end. Okay, and there's your carboxyl group right there in your generalized amino acid. Um, so, as I was alluding to earlier, protein structure can be broken down into four different levels because proteins can be pretty complicated. Uh, protein function is determined by interactions at these levels. So here is a kind of preview of what we're about to be talking about. Uh, there's primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure of proteins. And what exactly does this mean? What does it have to do with the protein's function? Well, we're going to find out. All right, so um, we're going to first start with primary structure. Um, if we're talking about the primary structure of the protein, we are simply just breaking down the chain of amino acids, right? Uh, so 
all we're looking at when it when it comes down to the primary structure of a protein is the what amino acid comes after what okay so it's just like we could almost write the primary structure of a protein out in a straight line um, of amino acids all bonded with peptide bonds um, so as you remember from the last video, we discussed R groups or side chains of amino acids. The R groups or the side chains determine the how the uh, how the amino acid chain is going to fold and how it's going to interact with other amino acids. Uh, it, that's largely determined by what what we call the R group, okay? Which we looked at a bunch of them. There's polar, unpolar, nonpolar, excuse me, charged, um, positive, negative, all sorts of R groups there. Okay, so just depending on the chemical, the chemistry of that R group um, it determines a lot of the protein structure and thus its function. Okay, so moving forward here, um, once we get past the primary structure, uh, if we're studying the secondary structure, we are taking a look at how the amino acid chains themselves, they fold and they coil into special shapes called alpha helices. And here's a picture of an alpha helix. And here's a picture of a beta sheet. Excuse the bell, um, it's lunchtime. So I'm using my lunch here. Um, anyway, folding or coiling is the result of hydrogen bonds between the amino acid backbone. So I'm like, hold on, hold on one sec. How does an amino acid have a backbone? Okay, I've highlighted this below. Okay, it's basically the part of the amino acid that does not include the R group. That's the backbone of the amino acid. So when these structures, when these amino acid chains are in this coil or in this pleated sheet over here, um, the backbones are actually have entering, interacting with each other via hydrogen bonds. And that's something that we learned about in 1.1 when we were talking about water. So water is not the only thing that can form hydrogen bonds. Um, so they form these shapes because take a look at these hydrogen bonds that are forming in between this like carboxyl group and this hydrogen over here. Uh, remember, oxygen is, is negative, electronegative, and hydrogen is positive. So uh, what happens is they end up interacting with each other and forming these they form a coil, and it's called an alpha helix, or it forms a beta sheet, or a beta pleated sheet, as it's often called. Okay, so hydrogen bonds, um, interactions between the amino acid backbones is what determines secondary structure. So let's move on to tertiary structure. Um, tertiary structure refers to the shape of a polypeptide from interactions of side chains. Um, so if we were taking a, take a look at this uh, picture over here of a polypeptide in its tertiary structure, Okay, we can very clearly see that, oh, look, here's an alpha helix, and, well, it's pointing to it, but here's a, here's a pleated sheet over here. So if we take a lot of um, coils, we take a helices, and we take the pleated sheets, and we combine them together, um, that is what we're referring to as tertiary structure. Um, and how these um, sheets and these coils interact with each other is determined by not the backbone of the amino acids, but the side chains themselves. Okay, so different side chains will interact others with different side chains, you know, depending on, you know, if they're charged or uncharged or polar, so on and so forth. Okay, so for two examples of side chain interactions that we might find in the tertiary structure of a protein, one of them is called hydrophobic interactions. Um, things that are hydrophobic or they're nonpolar, they, they tend to stick together. Um, they're like, hey, you hate water, I hate water too, let's bond, that kind of thing. Or let's, like, let's get close together. <laughs> That's how it tends to work. So um, two non, whoops, two nonpolar side chains might trigger a hydrophobic interaction, and that might end up changing the shape of this polypeptide. Um, also, there's some amino acids with, that have a side chain with a sulfur atom, um, and if there are two interacting amino acids with a sulfur that have a sulfur in their side chain, they might form what's called a disulfide bridge. Um, and that also holds together the tertiary structure of a protein. Um, so when these interactions by side, side chains are broken due to a change in temperature, a cha sudden change in pH, or maybe uh, as a result of an enzyme, the protein has become denatured. We're going to talk a lot about uh, denaturation when we get into enzymes in our third unit. Um, but a denatured protein is basically a broken protein. Okay, If the conditions are in such a way that those side chains cannot interact with each other, then the protein will literally unravel and it'll become useless. Um, and that's called denaturation. Um, that occurs at the tertiary structure. All right, and then finally, quaternary structure refers to multiple polypeptide subunits forming one macromolecule. Okay, so if we're talking about quaternary structure here, we're taking several polypeptides and mashing them together into one functional protein. 
Uh, so for example, this picture down here is of hemoglobin, and hemoglobin happens to be the protein that's abundant in your red blood cells. It's actually what makes your blood red, um, but it, hemoglobin's job is to carry oxygen from one part of your body to the next. Um, and hemoglobin is a uh, protein made up of four polypeptides, and when they're bonded together like this, that is called its quaternary structure. Um, and here's something to, important to note. I put it in italics down here. All four levels of structure determine the function of the protein. All right, so how these subunits are formed, how they're folded, and how they actually interact with each other and form one functional protein, the protein's able to do its job, is highly, highly dependent on A, the coiling in the beta pleated sheets, um, that's due to interactions between the backbones of the amino acids, due to interactions between the side chains at the tertiary level, and even at the primary level, what amino acids are in sequence. That all matters when it comes to the structure and function of a protein. Okay, uh, so from here we're going to move on and talk about nucleic acids. And again, I'm trying to make this video as short as possible. Um, again, excuse the bell, it's still, it's now fourth hour. Um, DNA is made up of two what we call polynucleotide strands in a double helix. Uh, so you may have heard of DNA while well, being a double helix before. You may have known that from a previous biology class. Um, and that's very, very true. The picture I kind of drew over here, it's not the highest quality, um, but it shows kind of DNA when it's unwound and it kind of just looks like a ladder. Um, and so we're going to talk about each, each of the parts of a ladder and some other uh, particular characteristics of DNA that are going to be important um, for discussions when we get into like replication and transcription and translation later on this year in AP Biology. So um, let's talk about DNA itself. Each strand, because DNA is two strands, um, it's oriented in opposite directions. So one's right side up and the other's upside down almost. Um, and we call those directions 5 prime to 3 prime and 3 prime to 5 prime. And you might be wondering, like, what does that mean? That doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, but we're going to take a look at why it's called 3 prime to 5 prime um, very, very sh shortly. All right. So as I put in my drawing here, I have a 3 prime end to a 5 prime end on one side. Then I have 5 prime to 3 prime on the other side. That's just showing that these strands are running in opposite directions. Um, so there's a special word for what we call DNA, and it's called anti-parallel. Anti-parallel. You may have heard of parallel before in like a geometry class or something like that. So what's anti-parallel? Um, well, basically what we're saying is that each of these two strands, they run parallel to each other, but they go in the opposite directions. Okay, so if they were running parallel, they would move in the same direction, but since they're anti-parallel, they go in this, well, they never touch each other, but they're going in opposite directions. That's anti-parallel. And the reason they're parallel is because every nucleotide, remember, polynucleotide strains, each nucleotide is in a chain, um, matches with a complementary nucleotide on the other strand. Okay? So, for example, I have color-coded these nucleotides here. We've got four of them, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, and I color-coded them in my little drawing. Um, as you can see here, A, adenine, always pairs up with T, and cytosine always pairs up with guanine, okay? You're never going to see A pair up with C or A pair up with G, anything like that. So that's what, are, what the matches are going to be, okay? So we can say that DNA strands are complementary, or the two DNA strands that make up, uh, well, a DNA molecule are complementary, but they're anti-parallel, all right? That's a very, very important to note. We're going to be talking about DNA a lot um, in this year. So a little bit more about those, what those letters are. Okay, A and G, adenine and guanine, are what we call, these are terms I'm going to ask you to know, they're called purines, and purines are nucleotides, or they are uh, nucleotides with two nitrogen rings in their nitrogen space. Remember, every nucleotide has a phosphate group, a either ribose or deoxyribose sugar, depending on whether you're in RNA or DNA, and a nitrogenous base, and this is where they become different. Okay, adenine and guanine are what we call purines. They have two rings of nitrogen in their nitrogenous base. And the pyrimidines are cytosine, thymine, and uracil, C, T, and U. Um, and they only have one nitrogen ring in their nitrogenous base. Uh, so U, uracil, is not what we're going to find in DNA. We're going to actually find that in RNA. So RNA has uracil, DNA has thymine. That's going to be one of the difference, key differences that we're going to talk about in 1.6. Um, and a key way to remember, I really, really like this, a good way to remember uh, which nucleotides pair up with which ones, A always goes with T, 
when C always goes with G. And a good way to remember that is the apple goes in the tree and the car goes in the garage. Okay, so that's how you can remember that, okay, A and T go together, C and G go together because we're going to be doing a lot of uh, replication and translation, that kind of stuff, and it's going to be important to match your purines and your pyrimidines. Um, so, yeah, let's keep going here. We're almost done. Okay, let's break down the nucleotides here. So let's get into what this 5' prime and 3' prime is, uh, is talking about here. 5' prime and 3' prime, they were both referring to the carbons, carbon atoms, individual carbon atoms in the ribose sugar of a nucleotide. So remember, ribose sugar, phosphate group, and nitrogen space, those are the three components of a nucleotide. Um, and if we break it down further, that ribose sugar, we can count the number of carbons. And actually, the way we count the number of carbons is what we determine direction and, and you might be wondering how that is, but I'll show you in a minute. Um, so the phosphate of one nucleotide binds to the three prime carbon of a nu another nucleotide to form a chain. So I've color coded these, coded these already. Here's our phosphate group. It's right attached to our five prime carbon. And then if we count down from there, we go four, three, two, one. Those are our other, well, four carbons in the ribose sugar, or this is actually a de deoxyribose sugar. Um, but we're going to be focused on this three over here. And here's why. Check it out. Okay, if we are binding a bunch of nucleotides together in order to form a polynucleotide or a strand of RNA or DNA, um, the phosphate group, as I drew here, is binding to the three prime carbon of its neighboring nucleotide. So it makes a chain that kind of looks like this. Um, so here's phosphate group, five prime, three prime, phosphate, five prime, three prime, phosphate, five prime, three prime. Um, so this is where we're getting that directionality from. I put this strand that I made here in the five prime to three prime direction because this five prime carbon is coming first in the chain. And then at this end over here, it's the three prime carbon. So this, this chain is running five prime to three prime. All right. Um, so what I was just kind of outlining there, the phosphate, five prime, three prime, phosphate, five prime, three prime. That's what we call the sugar phosphate backbone of a DNA molecule. Hold on one second. I have a model of DNA right here. Right, so here's our DNA molecule. As you can see, once again, A and T are matching up, C and G are matching up. Um, but this strap here that's kind of holding all of them together, that can kind of serve as the sugar phosphate backbone. Okay, so that's what's really holding the strand together. And if we break this apart, it's going to look something like this drawing over here. Okay, except this is more like specific. All right, so if we were going to add another complementary strand, what would that look like um, for this molecule? And take a look. Um, this, this strand, in order for it to complement this strand over here, needs to run in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction. Okay, so uh, there's our 3' prime. That's our three prime end over there is exposed at the end of that chain, and there's our five prime. So this is what a DNA molecule might actually look like at the atomic level. Uh, and as we can see, our nitrogenous bases, they are binding together. So we've got a purine, pyrimidine, purine, pyrimidine, A, T, or C, or G, and they bond together just like in this, in this model over here. Um, yeah, so DNA nucleotides are complementary and anti-parallel, meaning that they run in opposite directions but they match up with each other and covalent bonds form between the matching nucleotides. Um, so yeah, we've got covalent bonds linking the nucleotides together themselves from the phosphate group to three prime. And we've got covalent bonds holding uh, the, DN the two strands together through those nitrogenous bases. All right, that's it for this video. I thought that was the end. Uh, let me know if you have any questions um, and we'll see you next time for when we're talking more about nucleic acids. All right, bye.